Hi, my name is Alexa, and this is Queen of the Ring. To quote a 1975 article titled, The Villain Wears Lipstick. Women wrestlers in Parker's view fight nastier than men. Parker says, quote, Supposedly we follow the same rules, but it seems it's in women's nature to fight dirtier. I go by the idea, do unto others before it gets done to you. Today I'm going to be talking about the revolutionary wrestler Sandy Parker. Through just being exactly who she was, she set precedents throughout all of wrestling and changed the view of what a wrestler looked like and what who a wrestler was. Sandy would eventually become the first black woman to become a world champion wrestler, and she would become the first out gay woman to become a tag team champion and a singles world champion. The world that Sandy entered in wrestling had already been carved out by black women wrestlers. There had been a precedent set by other women champions like Marva Scott, Babs Wingo, Ethel Johnson, and Sweet Georgia Brown, and many more. But at this time, there had not been a yardstick laid out or a precedent set for queer women. I mean, there were definitely some gay women that were becoming wrestlers, I would imagine. But there was virtually no out gay women at this time in the sport. There was even less visibility for black queer women in all of media and especially within wrestling. And when I say there wasn't any visibility, it's because taking precedence at that time and now in so many circumstances, it's a case-by-case situation, is survivability. You have to be able to preserve and protect yourself, and being out sometimes is not the answer to that. The gay moral panic in the U.S. hadn't gotten to the place that it would at the time of Sandy's training, but it was getting there. It was a very fucking scary time to be an out gay person in the U.S. and all over the world. As I said, Sandy Parker would become the first out gay woman to become a world champion. And I've talked a lot about the inherent queerness that exists in wrestling, the showmanship, the strife, the community, the performance. And I hope to discuss that a little bit more today. Because as a people, we tend to easily forget history and the people that came before us. Because at this time that Sandy was out, as a gay woman, it was illegal to be gay in many parts of the United States. And it was considered to be a mental illness to be gay well into Sandy's career. And I think it was taken out of the DSM in 1975, which is not very long ago. I just want to be able to celebrate Sandy as much as possible because she deserves so much and I want to give her all of her flowers. Born in British Columbia, Canada, in Vancouver. Sandy was born, I think, in 1946, but I cannot narrow down a specific date of birth. Sandy was raised by her grandparents, saying, quote, when I came along, my mother left me with my grandmother because I guess she didn't want to take care of me. You know how that goes. Sandy was a big tomboy as a kid. She would climb trees, play baseball, beat up local boys, And that's just like so many of the other women I've covered, a childhood drawn to the stuff labeled masculine. When Sandy was 15, she saw her first wrestling match, and that was all it took. She said, quote, It was like someone shot me with a dose of heroin. I became an addict. I actually honestly became an addict. So many young kids go through that, too, that obsessive feeling they get when they find something they can identify with, something to pour themselves in something that can tell them who they are. Sandy continued going back to matches every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday, and she would even travel across the border to Seattle to see matches in the U.S. One day, while she was with a friend watching Judy Grable in the ring, her friend looked at her and said, you could do that, Sandy, and apparently she agreed. 
Over time, as she kept going back, she began talking to the wrestlers that were repeatedly working, and a few of them offered to train her outright. But apparently Sandy was like, um, I'm only 15, I'm okay. And she had the foresight to decide to wait and train when she thought that she would be a little bit older and a little bit more ready. And when she was, she and a friend went to their local library in Windsor and looked through the phone directories of the biggest cities in North America. They decided to send out a few letters to several different trainers, and after hearing a response from Lou Klein, they decided that that was the one Sandy was going to pick. At this time, Lou had already had a wrestling career of his own, and he had trained several other wrestlers who were reaping in the rewards of their success, one of them being the original Sheik. Sandy was only five foot two and 145 pounds. She was a very tiny woman, and her family was very understandably worried about her in the ring with all of these men. And the gym that she was traveling to was in Michigan at the time, and since she was living in Windsor, Ontario still, in Canada, she would have to take a bus there three times a week to train. Although I think it was close when I looked it up, but I am from California and I know nothing about anything. So while at this training, she was mostly trained by wrestlers Mary Jane Mull and Lucille Dupree. Lucille would later say in their downtime when they would be taking breaks, they would spend time at an ice skating rink that was nearby to cool down and relax and skate around the ice when they wanted just to take a break from wrestling, which I just think is a really nice visual to picture. Her training lasted four months, and she was only 22 when she debuted in the ring in Battle Creek, Michigan, and went up against her trainer, Mary Jane. Apparently, after trying to cash a check that had been made out to her wrestling name at the time, it was denied and made null and void, and Sandy decided she did not want to have to go through that again, so she was going to go by her real given name, Sandy Parker, her Christian name, I found in one article around this time that Sandy was very drawn to being a heel, being a villain. And I'm going to go on a quick tangent, but I think it will help us understand what was happening in the general zeitgeist and in wrestling. At the time of her training in the 1960s, the civil rights movement and the black rights movements were advancing, and the white people who were usually the promoters and the positions of power felt like a black woman as a heel would be too quote-unquote hostile. And that says a lot about how blackness is and was coded in the United States because this really wasn't very long ago at all. And I get if they were trying to keep her safe by not allowing her to pursue this character, but I would hope to think that Sandy had enough agency and enough you know, awareness that she would know if she was in danger at times. This story of American promoters not allowing Sandy to be a heel reminds me of a similar story, but almost inversed, which is the previous story that I covered and Queen of Our Ring, Aja Kong. Um, Aja, when she approached her Japanese promoters at the beginning of her career in the 1990s, wanted to be a babyface. She wanted to be a hero. And the promoters that she worked with used her blackness as a reason to say that she couldn't be that and that she had to be a villain, saying it wouldn't be believable. It just crosses time and space that usually men in power will manipulate and control narratives and in this case exploit wrestlers' gender and race to soothe societal moral panics, which are usually fucking taken out on black women in some way. And they used the narrative that was most convenient, basically. And where Sandy's identity intersects at being black and being queer, queer queer-coded characters have also been used as wrestling heels since the carny days. And I mean, of course, this goes outside wrestling to anybody who's seen a Disney movie is very aware that so many of their villains are coded as these gay characters in some way. But like truly almost every villain in Disney movies, or like any noir film from the 1930s, like kind of going into that trans killer trope like Silence of the Lambs. Back to wrestling, of course. Gay villainy had already 
been very much explored before Sandy started wrestling. And since she was drawn to being a villain, I kind of want to go over historically what queerness in wrestling has looked like and queer villainy within it. There's one wrestler that people usually point to when they're talking about this, and I'm going to talk about him too. Gorgeous George. He was a wrestler in the 1940s into the 50s, and his character occupied this crazy villainous space where he was very feminine, he had on incredible robes, he was very beautiful, his hair was very quaffed, and he always had his manager, who was his, also his wife in real life, come out and spray perfume before he would walk into the ring and she would, he would make her fill up the ring with this scent from this huge, redundant perfume-like pump, basically. He would also use his tiny woman of a manager and valet as a shield to the other men that were trying to fight him, and he would berate her in front of the audience, and his character was so coded as gay because he liked all of these, you know, eccentricities and frivolous things like (laughs) women-like And these villainous tropes of queer people span all over the world. Within Lucha Libre, there's a subsection of luchadors and luchadoras known as exoticos. And they've been prevalent since about the 1940s. Sometimes it's trans women performing, sometimes it's men in drag or queer men. And they're truly there to freak you out, fuck you up over all of this gender fuckery that's happening. And seeing these characters in these showgirl outfits and blowing kisses at their opponents is just so incredibly powerful to see in the face of machismo and hypermasculinity that's so present in wrestling. And exoticos are usually labeled as rudas, which are heels in Lucha Libre, but they are praised and loved and cherished still within all of that villainy. The hyper-masculinity that can be exuded from the crowd mixes up with the queerness that is so present and sometimes makes people very mad, but sometimes makes them laugh, and it's usually a pretty lighthearted thing when it comes to exoticos. And these queer villains continued on into the 1990s with characters like Adonis and Goldust, Dustin Rhodes' character, who was clad in all gold and black with a blonde fringed wig that he would wear and he would go out into the ring with a character like Luna Vachon who was super muscular woman kind of gender fuckery on her own and they would do these salacious things like lick each other and all of this types of stuff feeding into an over sexualized gay man stereotype okay I'm sorry for the rant I am done now And either way, we're back to Sandy, and she's not going to get her chance to be a heel until later on in her career. After getting all that she could from her training in Detroit, Sandy was advised to seek out Lillian Ellison, who's also known as the Fabulous Moolah. She would be able to train her further, get her regular work within the United States. And pretty soon after hearing that, Sandy packed up her life and she went down to Moolah's estate in South Carolina. And she said at first that everything started out actually really positive. Moolah was very attentive and motivational about Sandy's career. And at that time, there were multiple trailers all around the property for the multitudes of girls to stay in while they were training. And Sandy said the accommodations were fine, actually. But as time started to go by and months and months passed, Sandy was going on jobs that Moolah would send her on, and she was beginning to become very suspicious. It was about six to seven months in, and she started realizing that the first person getting every single one of the women's checks was Moolah herself, which there is nothing inherently wrong with, but they started realizing that she was taking her cut off the top, which ranged from 25 to 50 percent of their checks, and that depended on the wrestler, how much she would take, I mean, and then she would give the rest to the girls afterwards. And Sandy alleged that Moolah was also only giving the good-paying, high-profile gigs to the girls who remained on her good side, and that was a very difficult place to remain. Sandy said, quote, "'Everybody knew if you weren't on Lillian's good side, you got crappy bookings.'" 
I wasn't on her good side because I wouldn't do what she wanted me to do. That was one of the reasons I never worked Madison Square Garden, because every time the bookings came up, I'd be on her bad side. As far as I'm concerned, I could wrestle just as good as Tony Rose, Donna Cristianello, or any one of those girls. Mula was also very strict and had a lot of rules, and one that she set specifically for Sandy was that she was not permitted to go out to any of the gay bars that were local, which, like, lesbian bars in South Carolina in the 70s? Yes, please. Probably smelled like sweat and cigarettes and burgeoning love and lust. Sorry. Sue Green, another queer wrestler that trained with Moolah at the same time as Sandy, said that she had to hide her gayness from Moolah because she was very afraid of her reaction because she was an explosive person. And I do think it's interesting that she was aware about Sandy, but not about Susan. And I wonder what that's about. So even though reportedly Moolah knew that Sandy was gay, Mula would continue to try to set Sandy up with her fucking nephew all the time, which understandably made Sandy very uncomfortable. And Sandy also felt like this was very hypocritical because she alleged that Mula had her own quote-unquote dalliances with some of the other girls. And I must note that it is very predictable to be trying to control another person's queerness when you're ignoring your own desires, but also if this is true, there was such a big power differential between Mula and the other girls, and like she controlled their lives, and I just don't think that's very appropriate. But I guess nothing was appropriate here. Someone needed to call the Better Business Bureau. Somebody needed to call 9882300 Empire today. I'm not sure. Without just trying to set her up with someone that she would never be attracted to, something even worse is that amongst others, Sandy alleged that Mula not only attempted to set them up with men, she tried to have them sleep with promoters for more money in Mula's pocket. And a trainee of Mula's from about 10 years earlier, who was also a black woman named Susie Mae McCoy, also known as Sweet Georgia Brown, stated at the time that Mula and her husband, Buddy Lee, were attempting to force she and the women around her into sleeping with promoters for a higher price and sometimes saying that they wouldn't get their payment at all if they didn't do it. Susie's children alleged their mother said that Moolah would withhold funds from the girls, and she would hold it above their heads, which is just so horrifying and unimaginable, honestly. So this all sounds fucking horrific. When it comes to Sandy, not only is Moolah controlling her income— her housing, her career, she's also attempting to prevent her from having any personal, romantic, or social agency. She's trying to force her into dating men and participating in non-consensual sex work. It's not a good fucking environment. Like, truly, someone needs to call HR. So, obviously, from what I'm telling you, you can assume Sandy did not last too long there. But before she made her escape, while still at Moolah's, Sandy and the previously mentioned other queer wrestler that was training with her, Susan Green, became NWA Tag Team Champions. And it just feels like such a nice fuck you to Moolah for some reason. And I guess that the NWA doesn't actually recognize this as an official win, but the people recognize it as one. And that's what matters, I think, right? To quote a piece on pro wrestling stories by Krista Paglielli about queer wrestlers, quote, This is why queer workers as a whole enjoy women's wrestling so much, because they fought for their spot. They put in blood, sweat, and tears. We have something to prove to the higher-ups, to the fans. That's a quote from a queer wrestler, DJ Summers. After being genuinely fed the fuck up with moolah, Sandy decided that she needed to change the scenery a little bit. A few years before this, after also being genuinely fed the fuck up with moolah, the first famous women's wrestler in the United States, Mildred Burke, made her way over to Japan and brought her WWWA championship with her, which was the first women's title in all of the United States. And some people debate the first women's world title in history. 
So in about 1973, Sandy flew over to Japan and debuted at All Japan Women's Pro Wrestling. It was only April when she debuted, but she very quickly became a draw for crowds. And only within her first few months in the promotion, Sandy defeated Miyoko Hoshino for that WWWA World Championship. She ended Hoshino's almost 300-day streak and became the first black woman to ever win the title. Within the same success, she also became the first out gay woman to become a world champion. And this is the time when she actually got the opportunity to become the character that she had always wanted to be in the United States, a villain. And she was only able to because, as I had said before, you know, Japanese social scripts are different than they are in the United States. And like I had said with Aja Kong, she wanted to be a hero, but they still forced her into this villainous portrayal because of her blackness. So... The Japanese were racist in a different way at this time, I guess. But either way, Sandy remained incredibly successful within the promotion. She became an eight-time WWWA Tag Team Champion, four of those times being with Betty Nicoli. I mentioned Betty Nicoli in my episode on the legalization of women's wrestling, where she worked tirelessly to no success against the New York State Athletic Commission. Sandy herself had her own part with lifting bands of women's wrestling in the United States. After all of her success in Japan, spending about a couple years there, Sandy decided to come back to North America. And when she came back, she was a part of the first women's match in 50 years in Oregon in 1975. When she got this opportunity, she finally got her chance to bask in all of her heel glory, getting the match disqualified for slapping the referee right in the face. She continued to wrestle until retiring in the mid-1980s, settling down in Las Vegas. After retiring, she worked as a bartender, a store manager, and a security guard, like so many other wrestlers I talk about having these other jobs after finishing this When it comes to what wrestling has become since she retired, she says that wrestling became much more mainstream with what Vince McMahon has been doing with it, and that's not very interesting to her. She thinks he sullied it with the storylines he was promoting for so long, which I and so many other people could not hear more. In 2004, Sandy Parker was inducted into the Cauliflower Alley Club, an organization that honors wrestlers. And she deserves to be honored a few more times over, I'd say. I don't know much about her life at this moment, and or if she's still alive or where she is, but I hope she's doing well wherever that is. To close out, I'd like to give you a quote that she says in an article she's interviewed in. When I first got into the ring, I was scared to death. All those people down there either booing you or cheering you, Later, you're nervous, but you say to yourself, I don't know these people, and they don't know me. Hopefully, we feel like we know Sandy just a little bit better after this. (laughs) But that's mostly it. I just want the opportunity to celebrate someone like her. And I want to say thank you to her. Thank you, Sandy Parker. And if you're still listening, thank you, Queen of the Ring, is created by me, Alexa Pruitt. The music is by Kreider Dane of Helter Skelter Music Productions. If you like what you hear, join us again. Thank you so much. (laughs) 